Hello everybody. Here we go. We're going to do a little video. It's going to take about maybe 12 minutes. And uh, I'm going to go through uh, a, a very important rule with you. It is called the, uh, it's called the chain rule. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, what you see up on the screen right now is actually two derivatives that we haven't talked about, but they are um, fairly important derivatives because we're getting close to things like uh, Euler's uh, identity and stuff like that. Actually, while I'm at it, I should throw in one other one here. I mean, let me do that now. If f of x is equal to e to the x, you guys already know this one, but it's a good one to include. What you want to be doing soon is writing down somewhere in your notes a page that has all of the different derivatives that you're learning slowly. Maybe all the rules, all the derivatives. This is the stuff you want to get uh, kind of together in one thing so it's easy to remember. These you just have to know them and so you're going to be doing tests and if you don't know for example the derivative of log x in other words natural log of x and if you don't know that's actually equal to 1 over x you're going to be in a lot of trouble so please by all means make sure that you know the derivative of log of x natural log of x is 1 over x and the derivative of some number uh, some constant a to the power of x is equal to the log of that number times the original function. These uh, derivatives, you got to know them, and uh, pretty much you just have to memorize them. So take a moment to write these down at some point, and uh, let's move on to the chain rule. Okay, so the chain rule is a really, really important one. Uh, we're going to be using it so much. So let's, without further ado, write down actually what it is. So uh, what I'm going to do is say, if I have a, um, let's say, what should I do? If I have uh, h of x, let's make a function, h of x. h of x is equal to a function uh, with uh, function of a function. Now, do we remember what this is? So let's just say, what is this? This is a composite function. We did this at the beginning of the year when we were talking about different types of functions. A function inside of a function. It's a composite function. And what you must be clear, this is not this is not equal to f of x times g of x. This is not the product of two functions. It's the composite function means I have uh, a function inside of another function. In other words, uh, I, I could say this is equal to f of u where u is another function. That's really what we're saying. And, and, and it's important that we understand this. Composite functions are going to be used a lot here. The, so far, everything we've been saying has been fairly simple. Fairly simple stuff. We haven't dealt with any really, really complex functions. In fact, uh, let me give you an example of a fairly complex function that you might actually have. Here, let's say, what if I had y equals, now here we go x times sine of 1 over x plus the quarter, the quarter root of 1 minus 3x all squared plus x to the 5. Now, what is y prime? What is the derivative of this thing? Now, at the moment, you're looking at this going, oh my god, I have no idea. And I don't blame you. It looks a little crazy. Let's see if we can figure it out. So we got to start with the chain rule. And we're going to go back to that question, and we're going to see what we can do about it. Okay, so here we go. Uh, what is h prime of x? Now, that is actually equal to, so this is the chain rule. This is the actual rule. It is f prime 
of g of x. And I'm going to put some big brackets around this just so that we can really see what we're talking about. Multiplied by g prime of x. I could, uh, now remember, I could say this is um, h prime of x is equal to, um, if I had said this was equal to f of u, and uh, where u is a function, then therefore I could say um, h prime of x is equal to f prime of u times u prime. It's another way of saying it. Uh, the, the derivative of that function that's inside there. Oops, I think I forgot a bracket. There we go. Okay. Now, that's not the only way to write it. In fact, this is just simply how... Uh, this is uh, Newton's way. This is New Newton's uh, form of the chain rule. This is not the only way. Uh, let's look at uh, someone else. We could say, uh, if I have uh, y equals, I don't know, some function, some function, some function, some equals f of x, I could say that uh, dy dx, therefore, and I'm writing chain rule again, dy dx of some function, y, can be also written as dy of du times du over dx. And, and this actually is an interesting way of doing it. In fact, this is what would be known as the Leibniz form. Now, this is an interesting one because if you notice, if I multiply these things two together, I would probably have canceled out the du's and I would end up with dy dx. So it's almost like I've expanded dy dx in a very simple mathematical way, which is really kind of like interesting to look at. I've got the um, derivative of the function with respect to the function itself as a single thing. Like basically, this is the same as saying f prime of u. And du dx is the derivative of u with respect to x. And that's actually exactly what I'm saying there. That's, uh, that's that. And this is the same as that, and this is the same as that. These are all the same things. So uh, we're just writing it different ways. Always remember that uh, it's uh, always been kind of a point of contention. In other words, a, a thing that's kind of pissed people off is like, who invented calculus? Uh, you actually have two people who independently uh, created the rules for calculus, and that's Newton and Leibniz. Leibniz being this uh, neat, uh, kind of pretty cool guy from Germany who came up with it. And, and he wrote, of course, since he did it on his own, he, he invented a, his own way of writing it. And that's the whole dy dx and that kind of form. Whereas Newton liked to say, uh, f prime of x or, you know, he used the primes to describe derivatives. And so we sometimes switch back and forth because sometimes the way Leibniz does it actually makes things a lot easier than it, the way it works for Newton. Now, at the time, of course, uh, Newton was very, very powerful. He was uh, head of the the University of Sciences and Mathematics departments in, uh, I think it was Oxford. Don't quote me on that. He might have been uh, for another university in England, but he was pretty well known throughout England. He was, you know considered one of the smartest people alive and so when he goes oh i made calculus and this other guy from germany is you know i'm not going to say i had no name but relatively more obscure than newton uh, he comes up with and says oh no i also invented this thing called calculus and actually published the work technically slightly before newton and so newton of course uh wasn't just uh a brilliant mind. He was also a bit of a jerk. <laughs> so he, he made sure that uh, Leibniz uh, had his reputation ruined. And there is a lot of uh, newspaper articles written about how Leibniz was a jerk because Newton's friends would write about Leibniz in a bad way. And it was pretty messy. It, it wasn't a very nice uh, combining of minds. This wasn't like a scientific community that was like, oh, you came up with something also. Isn't that wonderful? No. They... Uh, bitterly fought over this and and it's too bad because uh both of the forms of this uh way of looking at derivatives is actually really useful to us now 
And so generally when people talk about calculus, it's seen as something where Newton and Leibniz invented it at the same time. No one was faster than the other one. Uh, so now that we know the chain rule, let's talk about using it. And let's start with something simple. Okay, I I'm not going to start with that crazy function I showed you before. I want to start with something fairly simple. So let's just simply say I have a function. Uh, let me go back to the color black. And I've got f of x is equal to sine of x squared. Now that's pretty simple. That's pretty simple. Now what does that what does that look like even? Um, that's kind of interesting. Let's let's pop over to foo plot. Now this is sine of x, and uh, let me see. That's x squared, and it's it's a lot harder to kind of understand what would be a function inside of a function. I'm taking the x squared and I'm putting inside the sine squared. So exactly what happens there? It's really hard to tell just by looking at the two graphs. It's it's almost impossible, really. Uh, it's much easier to kind of like think about the function itself. So let's just go back. We're going to call this sine of x of sine of x squared. Now, what does that? Let's take a look at what happens there. Boom! Oh my God, it looks so weird. Uh, but a lot of it makes sense. Notice that it seems to be a kind of a function that gets. If I start moving along my x-axis, it gets thinner and thinner and thinner. The periods get shorter and shorter and shorter, which kind of makes sense if you start thinking about it, because my x squared is going to get increasingly higher and higher really, really fast. And so the change from one period to the next, uh, the, the time it takes to go from one period to the next should be a shorter time as I move along, as my x squareds change ra more rapidly. Um, that also means now this is kind of an interesting thing if you if you think about it, if I look at say the this this first function right here from say like from what looks to be about 1.7 over to 3.1 hmm 3.14 maybe hmm, pi um, I've got a fairly uh, I'm not gonna say it's a low slope but it is definitely a lower slope than something over here because as I get my period shorter and shorter I should see my slope getting higher and higher. So that's kind of an interesting thing here. I should see um, a derivative that is showing a bigger and bigger slope as my maximum. Let's not forget what's happening here. We're starting from a slope of zero. Just look right here, zero at two point, oh, I don't know what that is, 2.12. And then it becomes a maximum positive slope and then it goes back to zero. So this is a, at the, at the y equals zero on my original function, this seems to be where I'm getting my maximums or, or in the case of right here at 3.14, my minimum. And so I'm looking at maximums getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So I think I have an idea what I might see as far as my, and you might even want to make a guess as what do, what do you think the derivative should look like? And, and for a moment, why not pause the video and, uh, Try to make a quick sketch of what you think the derivative of sine of x squared might look like. Because it's always interesting to try to find out if you could come up with the solution to this thing. So let me see. I got a negative slope here. So it's going to be negative. This is a positive slope. It's going to be up here. This is a slope of zero. Ooh, I think my derivative is going to go through zero, zero. Um, so there's a few things I can think about. Maybe I can even sketch it. I don't know. But I'm not going to do it. I want you to do it. Let's move on. Let's go back to our thing and say, okay, if that's my function, what is f prime of x? Now, maybe you can come up with this on your own. I just want to take a moment to say, okay, let me see. Let's let's do a little substitution. You don't have to do this. You can, you, but this is a a good way of thinking about it. Is that I can say, wait a minute, I got a function in there called u, and that happens to be x squared. Now, in order for this thing to work, I do have to know where is the function and where is the function that's inside. And most of the time it's kind of obvious, but that can be difficult. So therefore, um, therefore here I can say that f of x is equal to sine of u, which makes it a lot easier because then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, first off, according to chain rule, it is the derivative of the function outside. Okay, that's sine. So the derivative of sine is cosine. So it's cosine of u. Well, u in this case is x squared. And then it's all going to be, and I'll take all that, and I'm going to multiply that by the derivative of u, du dx. So what is x squared? 
in the derivative of x squared in in terms of x well that's that's easy that's power rule i know that that's 2x so i'm going to write this again i'm going to put the 2x back to the front now the reason why i do this is just because it it's easier to understand uh you don't have to do that but if you look at that if i wrote that as cosine x squared 2x you might be tempted to make a mistake and go oh is that 2x times x squared that's 2x cubed no it's not no it's not it's 2x times this whole thing so to make it easier to understand i usually put the 2x in the front that's just it's just what i do you don't have to do it but i tell you it does avoid mistakes now let's take a look at this thing so we weren't, we're going to add a function here. Let's just try it. It's going to be 2x. Now let's put that in brackets just to be sure. And it's going to be multiplied by cosine, co, oops, not coa, cosine of x to the power of 2. Let's color it red. Let's take a look at it. So let's see. Wow. Okay. Let's back up. Ooh, look at that. Look at that thing. Uh, by the way, um, that is not supposed to be blank here. That's just because um, the lines are probably so close together that uh, Fuplot is going, ah, and freaking out. Doesn't know what to do there. So what we can do is kind of like look up and we say, oh, look at that. The the ma What did we say before? The maximums are going to get higher and higher. And indeed it does. In fact, it's kind of a groovy looking uh, function. It kind of splits here. I have a, oh, it has a rotational... Uh, symmetry to it where I could take this part and rotate around and get the other side so if I flip this uh, do you guys remember what that one's called maybe you do maybe you don't you should what kind of symmetry is it and so I have this really groovy kind of uh, 2x times cosine x squared there's the derivative now I wouldn't easily be able to come up with this without the chain rule so chain rule here whoa so useful uh, so that's chain rule now uh, that is not going to be uh, the kind of questions I'm going to give you most of the time. I'm going to give you something that looks like that. So let's for a moment. I know it's uh, I got maybe three more minutes before I'm going to stop this video. So let's take a look at this. See if we can answer this uh, question. Let me erase that. So right off the bat, it's clear that we're not just doing the chain rule. So what's going to happen is that when you do questions like this, you're going to end up with questions where you have to combine all the things you know so far, power rule, uh, sum and product rule, difference rule, all of these are, are going to be combined because, for example, I can look at this and say, well, wait a minute, I've got this guy plus this guy. And so I know that I can get the derivative of the first one independently of the second one. I can just simply find the derivative of this and then deal with this one later. So let's do that. Okay, so now what do I got? I've got x times sine of 1 over x, which means I'm looking at the product rule. This is a product rule. That means the derivative of the first one times the second one times the first one times the derivative of the second one. So let's do that. Let's just check it out. So the first one, and in fact, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to I'm going to change colors so it's even more clear so we see what we're dealing with. So the second part, I'm going to, I'm going to color something else, but let's do the first part. So what is derivative of x? Well, one that's easy so i'm going to get one i shouldn't even write one i don't need to write one but i am times sine of one over x okay that's the first part and then what do i do i add the first part x times the derivative of the second one now oh wait a minute this is sine of a function which means you know what i got i gotta find out the derivative according to chain rule of sine of now what is that x you know what's easier easier to write x to the negative one don't have to but it's so much easier if i do that so i'll get to you in a second because now now i gotta add the uh, second part i gotta add the second part so let's take a look at that what is this thing now let's just look at that for a second that that right there is actually um, some function 1 minus 3x all squared plus x to the 5. I'll call that u. And it's to the power of what? It's to the power of 1 quarter. That's another way to look at it. So I'm looking at um, the derivative is going to be 1 quarter u to the negative 3 quarters times u prime. So let's think about this. I'm going to be doing, let me, let me write it down. That means this is going to be equal to 1 quarter 
this is chain rule. One quarter times, let me see, one minus three x all squared plus x to the five to the power of negative three quarters, because I'm doing power rule here on that big, that larger part. And then I got to multiply it by the derivative of u, the derivative of all of this. Now, that means I'm looking at the derivative d dx of 1 minus 3x, I should put brackets around that, 3x squared plus x to the 5. I haven't done it yet, but I got to do the derivative of that thing there. I should, that looks a little weird. Let me erase that. There, better. Whew. So, let's just see what we got. All right, let's keep going. Obviously that when you do this, it's going to take a few more steps. You know it is. So let's take a look what we got first off. Well, this is just one times sine of one of X. So I know this first part, that's sine of one over X. That, that much is so far so good. I can leave that one alone. Now what do I got? I got X times the derivative of this. So what is that? Okay. Remember that's the original, the derivative of the original function. Okay. So that's going to be cosine of well that's one over x or x to the negative one but it's chain rule i got to get the derivative of the inside one so that's going to be multiplied by what okay what's the derivative of x to the negative one well easy enough to do with power rule negative x to the negative two all right so i'll leave that alone i'll leave that alone and i'll keep moving along you can see it takes a little extra time here we go now this can I do anything to this? Let's just oh, let's just leave it alone for now. So I'm, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna touch it yet. I'm not gonna touch it. Just I want to get all my derivatives done first. So this is still well what it is. All right, that's x to the fifth to uh, the power of three quarters. Now I gotta get the derivative of this thing. Now this is an interesting one because I've got some rule because the x to the fifth is separate from this one. So let me just make a bracket here. That x to the fifth is an easy one. So I'm just going to do it first. It's over here. It's going to be five x to the four. That one's going to be done. And this one I can do separately, but wait a minute. Oh no, it's another chain rule. I got to do the outside first because really, um, if you think about it, this is, this is basically u squared, right? You see that there it's u squared. I got a function inside of a function again. So I got to do that. That means that's going to be two times one minus three X to the power of oh, one. Okay. So I leave it, but I'm multiplying by the derivative of the inside. What is that? One minus three X. Oh, that's negative three. Okay. Now this is where it gets a little tricky, but I got to do, I got to be careful. Okay. So I'm just going to write this all out in black. Now that means Y prime. Let's see if, so, you would not stop at this point. Now, technically, you've done all the derivatives. This is an answer, but it's not simplified. And this is part of the problem of using the chain rule or even any more complicated derivatives that you might or might not have. If you're going to use complicated derivatives, it's not enough just to get your first answer. You have to try to simplify as much as possible. This is what you're trying to do here. Simplify this thing. So let's do it. Okay, so let's simplify. First off, we got sine of one over X. Okay. Well, that didn't really get simplified. What about this one? That is okay. Well, let's erase this. That's not a net. That's not a positive because I got a negative here. So I got a negative now X, oh, X to negative two is over X squared. So X over X, that's just one over X. That's all that I'm going to be left with one over X times cosine of one over X. Okay. All right. Okay. So that's, it's a little cleaner. It's a little cleaner. Um, I can't really combine these two. I'd like to, but I could, no, I'm not going to do anything weird. Maybe I could check my identities and see if there's something funny I can do with a sine one over X minus a cosine one over X. But this is not really just simply a cosine one. I got this one over X in front of it. So I'm kind of, kind of stuck there. So I'll just leave it. Okay. Whoa. Okay. So let's, let's just take our time with this one. First off, this is negative. So this is all underneath. This is actually, okay. This is a giant fraction actually, because all of this is going to be on the top. All of this stuff is going to be on top. All of this is going to be on the bottom. So I've got, let me see the fours on the bottom too. So it's four times 
all of this, 1 minus 3x squared plus x to the 5, all to the power of 3 quarters. All right, and what's on top? All of this. Can I do anything with it? Let me see. Well, actually, this looks like I can do a lot of multiplying here. Let me see. 2 times 1 times negative 3. That'll be negative 6. 2 times negative 3 times negative 3. Okay, so that's uh, 2 times 6 times 3. That's plus 18x. Don't forget the x. Plus, well, 5x4. 5x to the 4. Can I? Oh, that 5. Shoot. I could maybe have done something with that 4 at the bottom. Uh, maybe gotten a 2 out or something. Maybe I could have simplified it a little bit more. But it looks like, like I don't know if there's some good roots here for an x to the 4x since it doesn't look like there is. Uh, I can't now. I probably would be satisfied with this at this point and go like, well, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. So here's my answer. I mean, can I write it any more than that? Uh, I could change this to cosine 1 over x over x. It doesn't really matter. It's still okay. So here I go. Now I'm finished. Now notice I had to simplify in order to make this thing work. And that is the chain rule. Now I've got a worksheet on Edmodo. It has all sorts of uh, practice for figuring out chain rule. I suggest you go through it before you do the test on Monday. Uh, of course, if you have any questions, if you have any questions, please talk to me. Please ask me. Make sure that the whole class sees your question. And so when I'm answering, I can talk to everybody about this. Did I make a mistake? I don't think I did. Anyway, if I did, let me know. <laughs> I have no idea if that's actually the right answer. But I think my math is good. But hey, you know how well I do my math. Whew, not so great. So um, with that, um, let me know if you have any troubles. Otherwise, that's the chain rule.